Hello, you smashing little marketing bees. You're tuned into episode 53 of the Marketing Buzzword Podcast. This is the Marketing Buzzword Podcast, the podcast where we dissect the world's most common marketing buzzwords. Hold on tight. We are about to fly around the beehive to see the latest buzzwords that stuck to the marketing bees. Hello again, and welcome back to the Marketing Buzzword Podcast. This is a podcast which helps you to understand what all these business and marketing buzzwords actually mean, and whether or not they can be helpful going forward. I'm your host, Ben Roberts, and in this show, I am the marketing bee in charge of making sure I get on the right guests and ask the right questions to make sure that these words and phrases actually make sense. And in today's show, we're going to make sense of the buzzword corporate culture. I know. Big term. But we're actually looking at actually how culture really affects small, medium, and big businesses. Before we get into that, I need to remind you this podcast is powered by Talktiv. Talktiv is a company that brings together live web chat, voice calls, video calls, and co-browsing together in one package embedded into your website. It allows seamless contacts through your customers through your website so they can have a chat with your agents in real time, adding a bit of a human side to your business. Take a look at talktive.uk to find out more. Um, also, if you are loving the podcast, the show, please do leave a review on iTunes. We've had one more go up recently. It honestly, it makes my day every time I, I listen. And if you put there, I'll give you a little shout out as well. It's a little bit of give and take. Um, but honestly, please do, if you are enjoying the show, please do leave a review on iTunes. John Asperian did, has left a video on my website, marketingbuzzword.com, which shows you how. Right, that's more enough about me. It's time to introduce this week's guest. And this week's expert buzzword bee is a guy called Craig Barnett. Now, Craig is responsible for the distribution of Cultivate here in the UK. He has over 13 years experience in sales, financial management and consultancy. Now, he started his career with a, at a company called Worth GmbH um, before being headhunted into the financial services sector. He then became a consultant and independent financial advisor. Then, then he went on to use his experience to join South Africa's largest private insurance, insurer called Hollard as an investment manager. And since then, he's gained a load of experience and knowledge and he had always had a passion for development and innovation, and which has led him to being involved now with with Cultivate here in the UK, which is a really cool company that are really trying to embed and really trying to foster companies to actually use culture within their organisations as a driving force, and actually not as a cost centre, but actually as a, as a potential profit centre of the future. It's really interesting stuff, and I think that I'll let Craig talk about it anyway because that's more enough for me. Let's get on with the show. Hi Craig and welcome to the podcast. Thanks Ben, it's good to be here. No, it's good. Isn't it? I love doing these sort of live, sort of face-to-face interviews. I don't get yeah. to do them that often. Usually it's through Skype because there's people all around the world. So it's nice to actually be able to sort of see someone face-to-face again. It's always a, a different experience. That's awesome. That's awesome. Now, Craig, you're the culture man. I've heard that your company and what you're doing is really instilling and trying to bring back, good look, improve culture company culture essentially and try and empower employees so today we're going to talk about company and corporate culture now why is culture so important because the way I guess I see a lot of people will see it is culture doesn't make money like culture sounds like it's a cost center for a business so why why is culture important how can it actually benefit businesses and of all sizes from the two-man three-man band where they've obviously got employees right the way up to multinationals what are the sort of common threads throughout Okay, I think it's a good question. <clears throat> um, so, at Cultivate, we, um, as you say, we aim to to improve corporate culture, um, and the reason that we do that is because, like you said, a lot of people will view culture as a cost, and does it really have an effect on the bottom line? And we're trying to get people to change their their mindsets towards that because your culture is extremely important to what you do and what the outcomes that you want at your company. So, you know, if we take some of the biggest companies 
that we know if you look at their culture so let's take a google everyone loves to you you know to use google as an example everyone knows that their culture is very much about work hard play hard so you've got a campus you've got a lot of cool fun hip things to do on that campus but google do expect their pound of flesh out of their employees um, and we'll come back to kind of their culture a little bit later but what we do when we meet with a lot of people and it's and it's mostly hr managers is we ask them what their problems are um, and a lot of them come back and say well their problems are that they're dealing with a lot of people that want to leave work people aren't happy in their jobs they're doing their jobs because they have to not because they want to and if you look at anything in life if you're doing it because you feel you have to you're not as productive as you're doing it because you want to so there's a statistic at the moment that in 2018 that 48 percent of the employed population in the uk will be looking for new jobs that's great for for recruitment companies but that's a massive cost for any company and so that's going to hit their bottom line mm. so same thing with like selling isn't it it's much more cost effective to retain your customers and take on new ones because we know all know recruitment companies are not are not cheap the finders fees are, are pretty ridiculous compared absolutely. to absolutely and so if you look at why people want to leave it's because it's not a fit um mostly because it's not a fit so they so they're battling with they they don't fit in or they don't fit the corporate culture of that specific company um the same reason as any company needs to root out a bad apple. I've spent most of my life in sales, and if you if you have a bad apple on a sales team, it can spread and it can affect the rest of the sales team. The negativity, everything like that can bring that sales team down, which will obviously bring the figures of that sales team down. So if you look at employees, I met with an HR manager recently, and she said to me, our employees are satisfied. <clears throat> and I said to her, that's, that's great that they're satisfied, but does satisfaction equal trouble? So you think they're satisfied, but there might be trouble brewing underneath. So satisfied employees are great because they, they do what they're supposed to do. They work from nine to five if, that, if those are their hours, but they deliver basically the bare minimum. Or do you want ambassadors? Do you want um, uh, employees that encourage other employees to do better? So do you want satisfied or do you want champions? And so do you want employee ambassadors? Because those, those are the people that make a difference. So while a satisfied employee might get by, they do the performance reviews and they get by, you want an employee ambassador. So you want someone that is better then excellent, they are influential in their excellence, they don't complain, in fact they gush about their company, they breathe, eat and sleep their company culture. And the important thing there is that you find people that will go above and beyond what the expectations are, and when they do that, the culture that you're building within that company is a culture of success not a culture of um, a compliance or a culture of... I guess lead, leading, leading with the carrot and not the stick, isn't it? it it's, a, it's, a, it's a case of actually that motivating people to work harder because they, again, because they want to and not work as hard as they, as they need to because they know that if they don't meet that level, they're going to be beaten, beaten with the stick. Exactly. And um, one of the things that I'm thinking of then is, as I'm going through this, I make, as I make my notes through it, I'm thinking, you, you mentioned about finding the right fit. Now... Uh, what's the difference between are the people okay are the people the problem then or is the company the problem so if someone comes into a business and they are more they're quite bubbly they have loads of ideas yeah. they have that they could be a great person they worked really well in their last company they were just looking for a change yeah. they come to a, a new company should a company it, are, are they the problem and they don't fit in with this new company are they the problem or is the company culture problem because every company needs to have its own culture but again every single personality is different mm. so 
who who is to blame and how do you fix that? Because that person could be on paper and the knowledge they have could have a massively positive impact on the company, but they don't work well with the culture. So who is the issue? Who moves first? Do the do the people try and fit into the culture? Does the company culture fit around the people? How does all that element work together? Because it seems like it's quite a complex mix to try and yeah. get it right. Yeah, um, I think that's a I think it's a good question. Um, I think instead of assigning, you know, kind of saying, well, the blame, if you look at maybe, you know, a company, all the large ones, a Coca-Cola, I mean, they, you know, they've got tens of thousands of staff around the world. So as you say, for them to try and fit into every employee's individual culture and for, you know, to find 100,000 people around the world to fit into that pigeonhole is near impossible. So I think you bring up a good point. Where the culture comes into it is, does that person fit with the culture of the business? And if the culture of the business is wrong, then absolutely, then the business needs to change that culture. So, if I can bring an example of, um, I won't name too many names, but there are companies that used to exist, um, big, big companies. And they fail to move with the times. They fail to look at the culture at the time. So a, a massive photographic company, um, it was on the lips of everyone back in, I don't know, the 80s and the 90s. And in the last 10 years or so, it's fallen off completely because photographs are no longer taken purely on, purely on cameras. Photographs are mostly taken now on cell phones. And so that company has fallen off of the lips of all those, um, of everyone around the world. What they failed to do was to match the culture. So they had some good employees, they had some fantastic products, but they didn't move with the times. They didn't have a culture of innovation or, or, or a culture of adaptation. So should a company change its culture over time? Absolutely. We work with a different you know a different generation of people so if you look now especially in the UK but worldwide most of your working population are now made up of Millennials so people born between let's say 1977 and this is arguable among <laughs> some people but 1977 to let's say 1983 most of the people born between that time make up the working population now we, because I'm born in that stage, we, we aren't, let's say we aren't happy with the way that, that things have been done previously, or we might just be a bit different because of our environment. But we don't want to work nine to five. We don't want to be pigeonholed. We want to, to be able to express ourselves at work and to be understood um, for what our different cultures are yet we still have to fit into the culture of the place that we work. If the company can harness that, I think they've got a very good formula. Um, but it's up to the company and the employee to meet in the middle. So to answer your question, it's up to both. Both company and employee need to meet in the middle and need to figure out if the company does well, the employees should do well, whether that's through share schemes, whether it's through being paid more because the company is doing more. Everyone needs to be working for the better of the company because it does the shareholders better, the management, the staff. So both should move towards a central point. Mm. I think it's an interesting point, isn't it? Because you, you want to, like we talked, we just, just before we went live, we talked about entrepreneurship and actually trying to encourage employees within businesses to become almost like entrepreneurs within the business to come up with those new ideas to come yeah. up with those the changes we talked about the the photographic company I can't, I can't try to remember who it is I know who it is but I can't think of the bloody name of the company but it, that, it's that thing isn't it they're do you not, want me to say it well, you, can, you can save one <laughs> Kodak yeah oh, and then yeah. Blockbuster is the other one I had on my list as That's well right. again yes um, and ones like that it was like actually yeah by innovating from within the business some businesses buy f innovation from outside but actually again a cheaper way of innovating is by yeah. empowering your employees <coughs> to to create ideas themselves yeah. now how do you 
how do you balance trying to encourage your employees to have new ideas but still focus upon the day job of running a business because it's great because I see some of these things in America you hear they people are, are let out one day a week or half a day a week they have they go out and they um, they go and do chat they are given half a day a week to go and do charity stuff or work yes. on their own side projects yes. or business and the idea of that is they go off they have time to do their own thing but they come back in they're refreshed and they love doing their job yes. but how do you actually make sure that that actually happens because <laughs> you don't want to obviously be micromanaging people because no. that's again I always said that the millennial coming up through Gen Z probably coming into the workforce stuff now is people don't want to be micromanaged but no. also how so how do you create a, a, an environment where there's trust but you also but there's a balance and they are still working really hard because it it must be quite a difficult one as a business owner especially if you've only got three or four people you want to encourage them to be active but ultimately if they suddenly slack yeah. you, your business is yes. going to really struggle whereas if coca-cola yes. if one of their employees goes off for a couple of hours it doesn't it's not the whole business isn't potentially going to fall apart <coughs> true true um so going back on google you know so i said that we'd talk about them again in their early days they made it part of their um part of their employees jobs that they would spend i think it was 20 percent of their time on their own things but their own things had to be ideas for the businesses for the business um, and so that would encourage people to then bring those ideas back into the business a, a lot of people might say well I'm not going to bring my ideas back into the business because my manager will take the credit or, or the or the company will just take that and they'll go and they'll make a profit and I'm left in my nine-to-five job I'm not earning much and the company could make millions from my good idea um, and so, which is part of the reason that we that we created the innovation engine, and that was the driving force behind that was that, as a company, I would hope that you would think that your most important asset are your staff, not your not your buildings, not your clients. It's been said that clients don't come first, employees come first. If you take care of your employees, they will take care of your clients. And so your employees are your greatest asset. If you hire good people, great people, those great people have ideas. They want to express those ideas. So you need to create a platform and a tool for them to be able to express those ideas and to share them. And if they're good ideas, do you support them? Do you back that idea? Whether that idea is to do with a new product, whether that idea is to do with saving the company money, do you back them? Do you give those employees a voice at the table? So you take very very large companies, and I, <clears throat> and I like to hit at the cell phone companies <laughs> because they do not motiv um, innovate. They're all the same. The only, the only difference is price. That is the only differential that they all have. And they can come up with this coverage and this and then the next thing, but they're all the same. And if they were able to innovate, and they employ a lot of people, you know, a Vodafone and O2, they do employ a lot of people and there are very talented people that work there. Are they harnessing those ideas? Probably not. In fact, most of them will cut their R&D staff and they and they send it out of the country. So most of the good ideas that get implemented here or most of the ideas come from external countries. So we're not putting the great ideas back into the UK economy, those mm. companies are quite happy to send it offshore. So we're trying to change that. So we're trying to say, we understand that there's risk, that you've got to meet compliance, that you've got to meet governance, but let's, but let's create a tool that mitigates risk in terms of innovative ideas and let's allow those ideas to be liberated and to, and to get pumped back into the local economy, to come up with new products, new features, um, mm. and that's what we've done with with the 
innovation engine. But we've had to have the other product, which is Team Foria. We've had to have that as well, and we will continue to market that because we're trying to create that culture of innovation. So we're trying to foster culture, change culture, and help companies manage and measure that culture, and then trying to get them to say, right, the next step now, get your, get your staff to innovate. Get them to give ideas, but you've got to create that environment where those ideas aren't just thrown in the bin, where they are fostered, where they are helped. You know, it's like a seed. You know? yeah. The soil has just got to be so rich. Mm. And again, that, that's where, yeah, I guess that's a, a nice way of analogy of put, putting it where you've almost got a, a flower bed essentially and where all, all the nutrients are put in there are essentially from the company yeah. and each of the bulbs is an employee within within that and you can see what, how depending on how good your soil is, you is how how well your plants grow. I mean, yeah. it's a weird sort of analogy, but I kind of like it and uh, yeah. I'm, I might use that one again. Okay. Cool, go for it. <laughs> no. And one of the things that I, I'm sort of making notes there that, you mentioned is is hiring good and great employees because obviously the employees as you I, and I 100% agree and this sort of stuff I talk about in some of my talks where we talk about it's pos- entirely possible to build a personal brand as long as it's a lot on as long as it's uh, aligned with the company's goals so you yeah. can put, people can have their own personal brands their own innovation their own culture but it's all as long as it's all tied in with the existing business brand there's no reason why a business shouldn't use their employees mm. and one of the things then that I've thought about from that and it is a, that's why I want to go on to this point now is you were h- talked about hiring good and great employees so how do you actually make sure as best you can because no, no hiring is, is ever 100% I'm not going to say is every single hire yes. you're going to have is going to be absolutely yeah. perfect yeah. but are there some certain things that you'd look for or certain things you do to try and make sure that you're hiring a person who is the right cultural fit are, you, are there specific questions you should ask to make sure that they are a cultural fit are there, do you get them to perform any certain tasks because obviously when you meet someone in an interview people are sometimes nervous some people look better than they are some people are just yeah. different because it's just it's, it's, it's an unnatural environment and so yeah. it's quite hard you may go oh that person I can tell they're quite bubbly or I can oh that person looks really quiet but actually when they come out of their shell they're actually a live wire so yeah. how yeah. is there a way of being able to test or ask questions or do something to make sure that you are employed because obviously it, you don't want to be tying up massive amounts of time where you're doing three, four, five rounds of interviewing again Yes. It's hugely expensive. So you obviously yes. want to make sure that those employees are retained, as we said at the start. But you want, how do you actually make sure you're, you're hiring the right people to start <laughs> with? Uh, that's a tough one. Um, because you could catch someone on the right day and they could say the right things. you know. But when they're actually put to work, so they might be able to talk the talk, but they can't walk the walk. So when you actually put them to work, then you realize actually maybe they were overindulging in what their achievements were in the interviews. Companies spend thousands and thousands of pounds sending new recruits or possible new recruits psychometric testing. Um, I know some of the companies, I come from the financial services sector and some of the big companies there, if the job is high profile enough, they'll actually get a psychologist to meet with the person instead of just the HR manager. But I guess there is no fail safe way. There's no you know foolproof way of hiring somebody. But what you gotta look for, and I often say this to people, is you gotta trust your gut. You know, at the end of the day you can tick as many boxes as you possibly can, but you gotta trust your gut. And sometimes the person doesn't tick the boxes, but your gut tells you I think if, if, if I'm able to train this person and if I'm able to, um, to teach this person, they'll, they'll do well, they'll soar. Um, mm. So I guess it's true, when you talk about hiring for culture, because I think that's one of the big things that I hear talked about is you hire for culture, not for skills, because you can teach skills, yeah. you can't hire for culture. So again, it's just trying, I guess, by the sounds of it, is although there's no foolproof way, it's trying to find a personality set that matches there is again like we talked about psychometric yeah. testing there are certain traits which yes although not perfect it, it it's very much a trait dri- driven thing so you can have say oh have they done 
a lot of extracurricular activities do they play sport you get an idea oh maybe they're a little bit competitive they yes. want to keep, keep fit oh okay they, <coughs> they've asked questions in the interview that's a bit of a questioning trait that we like that those sort of things so I guess I guess when yeah. you go into these interviews then it's just having an idea of the type of people and you'll be able to work out I mean you can work you can make a judge on someone within minutes but I guess yeah. it's, as a company if you want someone to match your culture you need to be almost writing down what are the things that you like but obviously having some sort of flexibility as again because if someone just slightly different comes in you don't want to you don't want 10 yes. of the same people in the company but you obviously want to exactly. make sure that you have different people and it's trying to think exactly. now which leads me on to my next question because obviously we both work for really growing sort of young startup companies and there's there'll be some issues facing our companies that are very different to some more larger more or even just generally more established companies of the same size yes and it's talking about culture when you've got lots of new employees mm. joining and also when we start getting to that stage where either our growth maybe doesn't quite match where we predicted and we have to potentially lay off staff or we bring in staff that we can't that didn't don't turn out to be the right cultural fit for yeah. example so how, we'll start off with the first part is how do we maintain a culture when you could potentially double, triple in size within a couple of months? Like I talked to you, I think we went from when I started, there were four or five of us and there are now like 12, 13 of us. And it's yeah. ridiculous. So how is there a way of trying to any best practice in terms of maintaining the culture on that side? And then we'll look at sort of if you lose the employees okay. afterwards. OK, um, so as you said, when you started, you know, there were only a couple of people and now you've, I think you've tripled, Something maybe like even that, yeah. quadrupled. So you guys have grown exponentially. Um, and a, a lot of the startup companies and fresh companies will have that, they'll, they'll just skyrocket in, in their growth. So what, we, what we've done is we found a product and so part of the process of keeping that culture, so depending on how big you are, do you call in a culture consultant? Do you call in an HR a consultant? Um, but what we've done is we've looked at the software side of things. People interact with laptops, people interact with mobile phones, even more than with laptops. And so you've got to try and hit them where people are putting their attention. So we focused on the software side, and so with Team Foria, we can, we can help companies measure that culture depending on what their employees are doing on the app or on the, basically on the software as a whole. So we encourage people through there to communicate, to, to give rewards, both up and down. So you can give peer-to-peer, Managers can give to employees, employees over to managers. So we encourage people to do that because that should help maintain and to build and measure a certain type of culture. Um, you can also measure that culture and kind of have a gauge on employees on are they doing what they should be doing? Are they happy? Are they not? Why are they not happy? Um, and so that should help with that process of how do we maintain a corporate culture so it's important that you've got to have one first mm. and I think it's important that the co-founders or the founding directors keep that culture and they try to keep that culture going um, I guess the fish rots from the head down isn't it as the correct. term goes so it, it, a lot of culture I guess stems from right from the top down I think that's where yes. difficulty some sees is where you've got uh, managers, CEOs, senior execs that are never never seen on the ground and that actually yeah. is quite a demotivating thing because when they see them it's only negative stuff for example yes. Yes. and as a cultural side of things that doesn't do well for company morale when you're only seeing this, two, this person like, once every six months when he only comes to have a go at all the staff. Exactly. For example and it's trying to make sure that that again that's an important I think that's a really important part that I wanted to emphasise actually I, I've seen yeah. that myself where yeah. it, if you've got a great leadership team then it, it really then the, everyone wants to be there every day if you've got yeah. if you're leading with fear it doesn't quite work. True. True. You know if we look at um, let's look at the businesses and how they were structured 
80s, 90s, the senior management, they sat in their glass tower. You know, they all had massive offices. Um, the general staff didn't see them, as you say, unless they came down to sort a problem out or to moan at someone or something. And the more that culture has changed around the world is open plan offices. Senior management are brought onto the same, you know, the same floor as the staff that they have to handle. So the more that we kind of progress, if you call it that, the more that we can see managers and companies are trying to get a better understanding of what the staff actually go through. So take a TV show like um, Undercover Boss. Yeah. They, CEOs, want to see what the staff are going through at the lowest level. So it is a need. There is a need for it. So we, we just created the software, or we brought the software in that can help with that. So they don't actually have to physically go to the site, but they can see what their staff are feeling. Are they happy? Are they not happy? Um, and so they can have a gauge of what's going on at that level. And I think that's vital to build that culture that the CEO understands maybe what his or her... I don't like the term lowest staff members, but maybe the most... I, I guess lowest pay grade. Yes. Or so, yeah, yes. staff that yeah. are either zero hour, le, 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 a smallest contract, smallest wage bill yeah. or something. Yeah. Yeah, as much as a horrible is to say, unfortunately. Yeah. 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 It's interesting when... I'm, and I was thinking is, one of things, before we go on to sort of the opposite end of that in terms of how you maintain a culture through fire, which I think is going to be an extremely difficult thing to do, is one of the things you mentioned was about a return on culture so how would you actually measure the return on investment in the culture so then that'd be one i imagine is a huge blocker for especially for companies say look we know that culture is important we're going to spend this money what 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 do we see back from it oh yeah, yeah we see more instagram photos of some yeah. slightly happier employees or yeah or are there any are there any other benefits to improving culture, how do you, how would you measure it? Or if you were going into have a, a, a consultation meeting, and you say, yeah. how would you measure w the culture of your business? Okay, so um, kind of the way that we correlate what a company or, or organization will will spend on um, not really culture as a whole, because you know we can't measure that, but what they spend on. On, on our products is we've got plenty case studies of how we've been able to to save money on how much a company will spend on hiring people mm. so because we've been able to improve retention we can prove that well we've actually saved you more money than what you spent on our on our software um, Judging it further than that is really hard because we've got you know we've got no yardstick to kind of go against. When we go into a company, we we always have a baseline, a culture survey. So within our toolkit, there are surveys. Surveys are really popular. Every company does a survey, but often you wonder. I'm answering all these questions, but what's it actually doing? Mm. Will the company change, or are they just saying well with with satisfying yeah is it a survey for survey's sake exactly and so that baseline survey will enable us to gauge an, em an employee engagement score and then from there we know that we've got something to work with so often um, an em employee engagement score won't mean much directly to the bottom line it'll have to filter down depending on the size of the company but Every company is after that vital score. Mm. What sort? What sort of questions would you ask in these surveys then to try and engage? What What was that? Is that score made up of? So if I'm saying, okay, I want, I've got an idea. I want to know, just sort of what 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 goes into that essentially, Craig. I was, okay. sort, of, I was sort of trying to beat you around the bush. Then it wasn't. Like, okay, I asked you directly, yeah, Craig. Yeah. What get, what what makes this score? Come on. What sort of questions would you okay. ask in these surveys? So these questions can be made up of questions like. Um, I would ask you, do
do you do you feel that your manager makes time for you? Do you feel that when you bring a problem to your manager that he or she makes time to listen? Do they sort it out? Um, there's questions that can be asked that go along the lines of, do you feel that the senior management or the board of directors know what's going on? Do you feel that there's honesty and transparency within your business? Do you feel that your business meets the requirements set by the governing body of whatever sector they're in, financial, uh, mobile, whatever it might be? Mm. It can be a lengthy process. It can take a couple of months, um, depending on what, on what, on how detailed you want that audit to actually be. But that gives a baseline kind of score of, you know, if you work for a financial services company, but you feel that there's no honesty, no transparency, and 30% of the staff feel that way, it's going to reflect in that employee in engagement score, which the CEO is going to have a look at and go, either he's the one, he or she are the ones causing it, but the board and the shareholders and investors are going to look and say, hang on, there's a red light here. We need to do something about this. Mm. Yeah, I think, I think that's a really good way of doing it. I think, it's, especially when they're a, like an anonymous survey, but you can sort of get an idea just from maybe the different departments where they've got different managers and stuff, but maybe not necessarily because some employees obviously don't want necessarily name by name because they don't want to feel like they're going to be yes. feel like they're going to be um, hounded down by their manager because of that. But it's, I think it's a good way of being able to get that sort of anonymized but just sort of get an idea for departments yes. and stuff just so obviously you yes. want to make sure you break it down so you can understand if there are particular because if you had 30 percent of your employees came back and said they were unhappy yeah. but they were all in uh, the warehousing side or they yes. were all in the financial finance uh, accounting team yes. then it's very different having 30 percent across across the board i think that's Correct. a really interesting point. now i think sort of to wrap it up then i want to go back to that second part that we mentioned earlier is mm. The hardest part, I think, <coughs> for maintaining cultures, I think, is when you have to let people go. Because obviously you see big companies, they sometimes have redundancies. Again, even yes. with small companies, for example, you've got five employees, four or five employees, and you've got to let someone go. That's, yes. a, that's, a, that's, a, that's like 20% yeah. of your workforce. <laughs> yes. Like, how, if you've got any advice for companies that would say, look, we've got to a stage and we either, especially I think with, with agencies, I think it's a big one, where they have some big contracts on retainer, and then suddenly one of those big contracts leaves and you're like, I can't maintain everyone full time anymore. And they have to say, oh, you have to go freelance something. Yeah. How do you, have you got any experience or any advice for companies that may have to let people go on how they can maintain a company culture? Like I maintain a, a, a fairly positive company culture or just try and maintain what they've got whilst losing, having to, people having to say goodbye to their friends. Um, yeah, so I've been on both sides of the, um, of the, the table there. Um, during the financial crisis, I worked for a small investment firm, and it was exciting. It was great. Um, the culture that was there, I feel, was good. Um, but it came time that basically we had exhausted all of our resources, and because of the crisis, we had to lay it well. I had to be laid off with a couple of other people as well. And um, <clears throat> I remained friends with the owner of that company because I, I understood what was going on. They were honest with me throughout the entire period. Um, they were honest with us as a sales team. And so when it came down to the crunch, we had seen that they had made personal sacrifices. They had, in fact, they, they had gone into personal debt so that they could keep the company going. Um, <clears throat> and they tried as much as possible to put the employees first. Obviously, smaller firm, it's, um, you know, the risk is higher. And so at the end of the day, we had to kind of part ways. Um, and it's never nice to be let go. And it's never nice to have to let someone go. I've had to let people go as well, and I can't. I think I have to say that if they, you know, if they've shown that they're dishonest or that they're blatantly not going to follow rules, you've got to rip the plaster. Mm. You've got to 
get rid of the bad apple for the sake of the rest of the team. Now sometimes that's very hard to do. So I think that depending on what situation you are in, if you can, you always need to try to to lead those staff members and to try and train them as much as possible. But if after all you have done, if they there's still no sign of a progression and and they dead weight, sometimes you've got to push mm. the dead weight off so that you can soar. Um, yeah, so essentially, it's there are two ways looking at it. If it has to be laid off because of of times of the the environment, the econo- economic situation, just the way that the company is, <coughs> that actually communication is potentially the best healer there, or it yeah. means that actually you don't have those neg- negative connotations around leaving, and they people leave because <coughs> they unfortunately have to, and as long as it's communicated the right way, and you see that. Look, again, the senior management aren't in their ivory towers and they're still yeah. having yeah. millions and billions of pounds of bonuses whilst yes. the man on the street, you're like, well, why am I inquiring? They, they could yeah. donate 0.5% of their salary and I could be having a job exactly. there. And again, that communication, exactly. that open, honest culture, then I think I 100% agree as well on the other one. is some t- If you've got a bad apple there, unfortunately... It, you are dripping off. You, yeah. Even if that, that someone could have been great at one time and then yeah. through other circumstances if they've stopped being they stopped turning up on time, they yeah. started being late, they stopped meeting all their <laughs> deadlines and stuff. Unfortunately it's un, the way it has to be. I mean you give a, you want to give people as much time as possible but yes. ultimately it, yes. the longer that goes on for actually by not ripping off the plaster you let things fester. Again it's like again you look at like an infection, don't you? Is if you leave if you don't treat the infection it just gets worse and it spreads to other parts of the business the longer you're infected for so exactly. you, tr- you deal with it and then you can go back to to where you're at no exactly. thank thanks so much for coming on today Craig it's been, I think it's been a fascinating co- um, conversation about culture across all the, all the C's um, and I love sort of what you guys are trying to do with the innovation engine where you're trying to encourage those employees to really sort of take a stand for themselves and use yeah. what they've got and again for companies to actually look leverage what, yes. what have you got and you're actually probably spending most of your most of your money on your employees so you want to yes. encourage your employees to to really be a part of where you're going because again yes. if a, the longer an employee stays with you and they feel like they're valid they stay with you saves you money in fact it helps bring you in more money and it's a absolutely. it's a great way of looking at things absolutely absolutely now ben thank you thanks for having me on here and uh Maybe, you know, just one parting thing. We definitely feel that the road to success is is a relationship between the company and employees. And so there are, maybe it's not equally yoked, but they definitely have to walk the same path. And it's, you know, if one is pulling the other one along, there's a problem. Mm. No, I think that's a, a fantastic way to end. But, Craig... Before I let you go, I'm going to ask you the question I ask everyone at the end of each of these podcasts. I can see the yeah. look of... This is, this is oh, great. No. I, can, I can see the look on people's faces now when I do this. Oh. Um, and what is a a marketing buzzword out there right now? Are you loving or hating? Is What is sort of grinding your gears, making you a little bit like, I wish people don't say this or I, this, word had ne- this word or term had never been invented or something you actually know what... I, I can get behind this and something I, I think is going to be really important going forward. Oh, jeez. Um, <laughs> so most of my, most of the staff that work with me and kind of anyone that really knows me, I'm not a, I'm not that active kind of on social media other than the mainline ones. So all of, you know, things like hashtags and things I kind of sit on the fence a bit between being <laughs> ultra modern and kind of still a bit old fashioned, but I think, oh, a, kind of a term, and I've said it a few times in this interview and it drives me nuts, is this, tick the boxes. I hate that saying. <laughs> I've said it, I think, two or three times during this interview, but the saying, oh, it definitely ticks the boxes. It's like, <laughs> what? It's It's just... Uh, it drives me nuts, but unless you're filling in one of those surveys, unless you're, you're filling it. in a survey. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but what I oh, one that I do like, oh, I guess it would have to be something with culture and innovation. 
No, no. Anything to do with um, with being better, you know, kind of self evaluation and being better. I believe in the UK e economy. I think um, maybe something that would drive me nuts the negative comments about Brexit. Um, it it doesn't matter how you feel about what's going to happen. I feel that we need to believe that our economy, our people, our country, our companies will prosper and will survive. We have to. What we have is great and we need to keep it and we need to build it and maintain on that. So negative, whether you think it's positive or negative, you need to get behind the fact that we are going to achieve, we are going to do great things, and we have to put the negativity aside, and we just have to. So anything to do with negativity, uh, I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> Uh, Let's just push forward. Yeah, I think I can't believe I'm going to say this. I've been wanting to say it all thing. <laughs> and I think you know what's coming here. Yeah. I think we're going to make culture great again. <laughs> Let's make culture great again. Hey, uh, thanks so much, Craig. Brilliant. Thanks, Ben. Yes. I actually love that. And I mean, as maybe as corny as it sounds, trying to make culture great again, I mean, it, it, it sounds a little bit corny, but f it's one of those things where you think about it and go, actually, culture is often viewed potentially as, as a a nice to have can often be viewed as a cost center spending money and resources on trying to keep employees happy and trying to get them to create innovative solutions but actually that entrepreneurship the the ideas and developments from within a business actually saves money saves time and actually for the amount of investment you put into in order to encourage employees to help contribute to the the long term and future growth of the business is actually an amazing way of actually being able to grow your own business. Whether you're large or small, there's all sorts of ways in which you can harness the power of your employees and your corporate culture in order to grow. I think it's a fascinating topic and one that I'm so glad Craig, Craig, Craig came on and, and talked about. So, thanks so much Craig and we're back on Monday with, on Monday? Back on Thursday with another bite-sized buzzword, and I tell you what, oh my god, I have got some big podcast guests lined up for you in the next couple of weeks. And I say big, I mean these are names in the marketing and marketing world that you guys are going to know and you're going to love. I cannot wait to share these next couple of interviews with you. So that's all for me for now. Goodbye. This podcast is part of the You Are The Media Network.